Hello and welcome to this Fintech Futures video interview. My name is Paul Hindle, editor at Fintech Futures, and today I'm joined by Vahi Andonians, Chief Technology Officer, Chief Product Officer and Founder of Intelligent Document Processing Company, Cognaze. Vahi, thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with me. And to get started, would you like to quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the company? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you said all the important points. I'm a technologist at heart and I founded uh, Cognize a couple of years ago. Um, the company is um, extracting um, actionable intelligence from unstructured documents. Unstructured documents, any kind of document that you know, computers struggle to process automatically. Um, it could be PDF documents, Word documents, you know, even Excel documents or websites, uh, chat protocols, any emails, anything that is written, basically. Sounds good. And I guess to start with then, what challenges do financial services organizations in particular face in dealing with the, the deluge of, of documents and information that they receive on a daily basis? Yeah, so I think that um, these challenges are actually very classical challenges and are very, very new, although they get more complex. So the first one, I think, is um, the regulatory challenge, compliance. Right? So that reg the regulatory framework changes a lot. Um, KYC, AML, definitely changed over the last year due to the political situation that we have right now. And then plus, you know, GDPR is added as a complication and the ESG is added as a complication and so on. So I think the framework is um, is um, changing and it is hard to keep up with those changes. And then um, the financial industry, of course, is in a dire need of speed of processing information at a very high accuracy. Right? There are industries that don't need that high of an accuracy, but the financial industry does because a small mistake can be very, very huge right, for, the, for the company. Uh, and of course, uh, the financial industry has uh, specific data security needs because they're dealing you know, very uh, important, but also not usually not publicly available information. Right? Uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, they, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We are producing so much more unstructured information and you know, they're struggling with an overload, getting so much information to, to be processed manually um, and, and need solutions to process as much as possible automatically. And so so what then is, is Cognase doing that's, that's different to, to other players in the space and in terms of helping these financial services firms better manage their documents and, and drive better analysis and decision making? What really differentiates us is that we are using deep learning and only deep learning. If you think about it, when we talk about unstructured documents, there's actually no such thing as an unstructured document. They're very structured. They're just structured for humans and not for computers. Right? And with deep learning, we can address this. Why? Because deep learning is in a very rudimentary way, mimicking how our brain works. Right? So the assumption is because we can read it, deep learning can learn it. Of course, deep learning learns much at a much slower rate than humans learn. Because evolutionary, we have built to we have been built to be learning machines. Let's take a very simple example. Right? If you are uh, 10,000 years before now wandering in you know, a jungle uh, with a person and you see identify a pair of yellow eyes earlier than the person next to you. The person next to you is going to be the dinner for a, for a tiger where you will survive, right? So evolutionary, you have been built to identify objects much faster, right? So, um, and that advantage that we have to learn much faster, right? Well, computers don't have that. So they need an humongous amount of training data, which is not usually available in the industry. But through our you know, innovations that we have done, a series of innovations in process and in models and other things, we address this problem adequately and make it possible for companies to actually use uh, deep learning to extract information out of documents. You use the term hybrid intelligence then as well when describing the, the approach to AI. Can you tell us a bit more about what you mean by that? Sure. So it's actually very interesting because um, we, we, we strongly believe in this. So what we mean with hybrid intelligence is that we shouldn't look at AI as a competitor to humans. I understand it will change our society and I understand it will change a lot, uh, uh, you know, how we deal with things. And I'm sure there will be many, many jobs that are rendered unnecessary with AI, but we'll also create actually jobs. And I always thought, and I still think that we'll create more than we destroy. But that's not the important part. The important part is together with 
AI and humans, we can achieve a better decision point because humans also have flaws. And right? we have over 20, you know, well-documented cognitive biases. You know, Daniel Kahneman had made a huge career out of this writing about, you know, bias, noise, and so on and so on. And there are so many books, it's framing uh, and other experiments that he has done where you can clearly show that humans also have biases, right? And then humans get tired, and then we have a noise, right? His latest book about noise is actually very interesting. Right? But then we have also huge advantages, right? We can differentiate between, you know, uh, causation and correlation. We have a model of the world. We can predict much better. We can, and so on. Right? So machines are a little bit different. Right? They, um, they they don't have a noise. They've always come up, very often come up with the same decision or a better controllable same decision. They don't get tired. You can do it all the time. And they bring the cost of prediction significantly down. Uh, they are, if you build it that way, much faster than a human is, right? So both of them have distinct advantages. Now, if we combine those meaningfully, we can get to a better decision point, right? And that's not only important uh, for uh, um, medicine, for example, where, you know, the combination between human and AI makes a better prediction of pneumonia than any human could do, right? So you're actually really saving a life there. But it is also very, very important for the financial industry because the financial industry is spearheading change in the society. Right? So it's a, it's a very important industry. Without the financial industry, we cannot transform our energy creation from coal and gas to I don't know, renewable energy. Needs to be financed, and we need, you know, AI to help to make better decisions in these things. So I think um, uh, what the way we see it is, we should not look at it as a AI replacing a human, but together coming to better decisions. And with hybrid intelligence, we need exactly that. Excellent. So, so I guess, how do your customers then measure the value or return of investment they're getting with with the products that you're, that you're providing them? Yeah, I mean, I think that is uh, that is. Um, rather easy because we look at it end to end. So we look at it end to end by saying, look, um, you're processing this kind of document and it takes you that much time or that much cost to do it. And it's end to end. Now you still need humans because it's going to be a hybrid intelligence approach, but you also have lots of automation added to it. So these humans will not only come with a better decision points, more consistent, which you can measure obviously, but also uh, it will be cheaper in the production at the end of the day, right? And both of those you can measure. Either you measure it in time or you measure it in, you know, time uh, um, uh, converted to, you know, currency that you are paying those people. But at some point, it will be more consistent, higher quality data. Both of that is measurable, plus a little bit cheaper in the production that is also measurable. So you have three KPIs that are easy to measure and we're, we urge everybody to do that. We automatically track this information, but we also urge our clients to track them themselves, obviously, because, you know, should not be the person who does it and also measure it yourself so somebody else should, should check you. So we, we urge our clients to do that. Sounds good. Uh, in in the AI space, one of the big things that's, that's come around recently is is obviously generative AI, um, particularly things like ChatGPT as well, have been taking up a lot of the headlines. How then do you see the market advancing with with this kind of explosion in in popularity of generative AI? Yeah. So I mean, first of all, I think um, uh, ChatGPT is a beautiful piece of technology. Um, I, I, you know, it's not in the same space that we are because we are really about the extraction of gen generating uh, content, but it is, you know, very, very uh, interesting piece of technology. Of course, it comes also with a couple of problems, right? So, and I think at the heart, it's obviously a large language model called LLMs, right? So it's huge, huge, huge models. Um, uh, so how, how do we build them? It's actually not a, um, a scientific approach at the end, right? So because the the core technology, the core science was developed by Google in 2017, right? So it's really just uh, taking this core science and then applying it to a humongous amount of data, which is an engineering practice, right? So it's really not about a science, it's about engineering and scaling up system and making it possible to, I don't know, exabytes of data to be in true, right? Um, so it brings me, of course, to the, uh, to, to the first problem. So... A very famous quote uh, from Peter Norvig, uh, who was back then at Google, I think he's still at Google, but back then he was at Google. He, he said, um, more data beats better models, but better data beats more data, right? And so what 
OpenAI did is they questioned that with a couple of billion dollars. You know? So they put a couple of billion dollars behind exactly questioning that poll. And they trained on a humongous amount of data, which obviously not everything in that data will be correct. So it turns out that in some cases, not having an correct data, but noisy data actually might even help you. Right? We call this the wisdom of the crowd. Right? So if more data, even if it's noisy, it actually helps you. Predicting the weight of an ox is a classical example. If you just take a subgroup of it, you get to a worse result. But if you ask more people, you get to a better result on average. Right? So predicting the next word is exactly such a problem. That is why ChatGPT is so convincingly good in telling you something, right? So like it tells you like very, very convincingly, very, very interestingly the, the point, right? But at the same time, you know, it struggles with the correctness of the data wherever the wisdom of the crowd doesn't work. So if I talk about, you know, Higgs bosons or you know, something that, you know, you can't go out to the street and ask a thousand people and build the average and then come up with something meaningful. Right. Uh, in those cases, it actually struggles with this, right? So, I mean, there's, it's well documented. There are so many examples. I have in my blog uh, some examples, but there are many, many more examples in the internet. Right? Very convincingly tells you something very wrong. So now pair this with a with the cognitive bias that we have. That more convincingly, more detailed the story is told, the higher is the probability that we believe it. Right. So even I, I asked the question. I knew the answer. I think it was a question about uh, the the French National Guard's uh, color of the of the uniform during the Napoleonic Wars, and you know, uh, and it, it very convincingly said something wrong. And even I was so convinced that I had to go back and double check my previously knowledge because it's like was so convincing what it said. So that's, uh, of course, a, a problem that is very convincing, but at the same time, not always correct. Uh, the next problem is that prompt engineering is still a thing. So you can still, it means the way you ask your question and it influences the answer a lot. Right? Very easy example, which I literally did a couple of minutes ago to test if it's still correct or not. So if you ask now, ChatGPT 4.0, it, it takes you, I don't know, three minutes to cook an egg, how, how long does it take you to cook five eggs? Previously, it would just multiply three by five. Now it doesn't. It tells you actually, oh, you know what? You can make it in one pan and then it will also take you only three minutes. Good. But if you ask the exact same question and you just say like three eggs take you, or one egg takes you, you know, three minutes, how long does it take you? 4.5 eggs. It gives you a totally wrong answer, right? Multiplies 4.5 times three. There is no recollection about, you know, what it is actually doing. So we just a simple change in my input, I get a very, very different output. So like prompt engineering is still a thing. I think uh, Sam Altman himself predicted that in a couple of years, five years, I think he said in an interview last year, so in five years, it's, 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 it's going to be sold, but now it's still an issue. So, so that's another thing. And then, of course, these large language models also struggle a little bit with the hallucinations. I think uh, New York Times um, um, brought this brought this up when they talked about uh, when a reporter was you know talking to chat GPT through Bing basically, and then suddenly it goes from you should divorce your wife and I don't know all these things. Uh, we call this hallucinations, or it goes into something and doesn't come back. Uh, and of course, what is still also a problem is these large language models are not only very very expensive to build through billions, but also the cost of prediction is high. So we literally need computing power to come up with the prediction. And these are issues, of course, that uh, you know will will be addressed. Some. I mean, we personally have cognized addressed this for this industry with our four pillars because what we what we are doing is first. We're building continuously learning systems, right? So GPT is not some a system like that. So like literally, we're building a system where mm, the training data is generated as a byproduct to your extraction process that you're doing. And over time, the systems just get better automatically. Right? And then we are about domain-specific foundation models. So we look at really financial data, which has the advantage that uh, we can then outperform generalistic models because it is targeted to one thing and understands the nuances and details of that language and of that industry. And of course, hybrid intelligence, which we talked about already. And then lastly, we as a company believe that the IP of whatever models are created should lie with the client, not us. Uh, so, so our clients retain the IP of the things they're doing. This is how we are addressing, you know, our, our um, you know, AI. And I think, um, uh, all of these points are actually make a lot of sense for the financial industry.
Having said that, you know, I still think ChatGPT is a beautiful technology. I'm using it a lot, actually, to write emails, for example, it works perfectly fine. Great. So, I mean, I guess just to finish off, then, what what are you most excited about then in the space, and and, and what's next for for Cognos? In the space, I think, uh, as I said, I think with AI together, we can achieve new heights, right? And I think this is very important. It's very important for the finance industry, as I said, but it's also important for other uh, sciences, right? If you take life sciences, for example, right? in life sciences, we have an effect which is called the Evum effect. So over time, things get more expensive to be produced, right? So it's not like more, Moore's, Moore's effect. The other way around that we have in you know in other industries, but really the opposite of it, right? And that's a problem because it means that producing new drugs is costs too much money, it takes too long after a few iterations, right? Because expectations, regulation, and other issues. Right? I think with the AI, we can address this very well. Just look at what, you know, AlphaFold um, from, from, from Google did with, you know, DeepMind, and um, I think it's called AlphaFold, which is predicting how proteins are folding, right? Which is a very important piece in drug recovery and in other things. And that is something that wasn't even solved before. So humans had, you know, some ideas and some hunches, but we, Really, we didn't know how to do that. And with AI together, now we can do it. Now, combine this with, you know, creativity of humans, you can literally produce drugs much, much faster, right? Now, combine this even more with CRISPR, Cas9, and then you will see where it can go. So I think we can just build a better world in a faster way with the help of AI. And I'm very excited about this. Um, and I think it's also, it's not only exciting, I think it's actually important to have this capability because the world gets more complex and we need help to address all these problems, right? It's not, the answer to our current problems is not just one sentence, very easy, and we just go left or go right, right? It is a complicated world and we need to find solutions to complicated problems. Right? And I think we need AI actually for those things. And that, that excites me. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, no, exciting times ahead indeed. Well, thank you again so much for, for joining me today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you.